Hi, I'm Hans Riemer, and I'm an at-large member of the Montgomery County Council. I'd like to invite you to join me for a conversation with Hank Greenberg, AARP Maryland's State Director. That's coming up next, right here on County Cable Montgomery. This Snow Boundaries travels to Denison's Brewing Company in downtown Silver Spring. Since 2014, Denison's has been brewing craft beer, serving it on site, and distributing it to other bars in the county. Today, their brewers are hard at work during the taping of this show, featuring Montgomery County Council Member Hans Riemer and AARP Maryland State Director Hank Greenberg. Um, we're here at Denison's Brewing Company, so you can hear the uh, great work of brewing beer going on in the background. Uh, it's a really exciting place, actually. But um, first of all, just thank you for being here today and uh, meeting up with me. I'm, I'm really pleased. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. I serve on the county council. I'm one of the four at-large members. I represent a bit more than a million people. Um, and I come to the work at the council from a background in public policy issues, especially social security um, and health care uh, at the national level. Um, I've worked in voter mobilization. I was Barack Obama's national youth director. I worked at Rock the Vote. Um, but I also worked at AARP. And I think that's really what led to this. Ever since my very first job in Washington, when I was an intern uh, in 1994, I have gotten to know and interact with leaders of AARP. John Rother oh, yeah. was one of my early mentors. Um, and, and AARP has always, in fact, uh, been very closely involved with the work that I have done. I've been on the county council now for six years, and I have the chance to work at the intersection of a lot of the same issues. But maybe you could share with me a little bit about your background. Um, you know, I spent many years at the Office of the Attorney General in the Consumer Protection Division, and that's how I started, really, in what I thought was a career in public service. Right. And I did that under three attorneys general. Uh, first it was Steve Sachs, and then Joe Curran, who I worked with for 20 years oh, wow. until he chose uh, not to run for re-election when his son-in-law ran for governor. You might remember that. That's right. um, I would consider him to be a mentor of mine. Uh, that, that Joe just had a wonderful attitude about public service. He was, and, and, and really that's what I'm following. I'm following a, very much his, uh, his view. I then had the opportunity to come to AARP, which to my mind is an opportunity to continue a career in public service, only to do so through the nonprofit sector rather than through the government sector. Fantastic. So w when I moved to Washington, um, I was, uh, I had done an internship and I got to work for a man named Robert Ball. And uh, Mr. Ball had been the Commissioner of Social Security under Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson and a little bit of Nixon. Um, and he was the great thinker, leader, strategist mm. for expanding Social Security. He implemented the Medicare program after it was passed uh, it, through Congress. Um, and he worked to protect it through, through decades as again, the sort of the, the thought and strategy leader for the social security world. Um, I then went to work for a man named Arthur Fleming. Uh, Dr. Fleming was 90 when I started to work for him. And he uh, had been in every, he had worked for every president since Franklin Roosevelt. But when I think about the influences in my life, you know, the, uh, my parents and their involvement at the P as PTA mm. head or, um, you know, the ACLU. My mom and my dad were both very active with the ACLU, uh, you know, running the Neighborhood Watch program meetings out of our living room. Taught me from a very young, young age that that's normal, you know, that uh, you can do that too. It helped me sort of just assume that that was part of life. Um, and then as I began my professional career, the chance to interact with these really just, uh, these great lions of policy making. It was just a very special connection for me and it made me passionate about an issue like Social Security, which a lot of younger people think is pretty abstract, pretty removed, and only for older people. Right. But of course it's not. Um, how, who are some of the big influences in, in your life and, and how has that influenced where you are today? Well, you know, it's, I'll start with my parents yeah. because uh, 
frankly, a lot of what we do has to do with the, the nature of our country and how it, the demographics of our country. Right. Number, not only are we getting older, and, and frankly, the wonderful example you have of the person who's 90 years old and becomes an influence to you, that's really all about disrupt aging. You know, the thinking that we have about disrupt aging, nice. that, uh, you know, uh, you're never too old uh, to learn something new. And you're never too old to influence others. And so that's, I think, a great example. So I'm glad you're sharing that with me. In my case, my, you know, my parents uh, had a very uh, colorful history. Uh, my dad, uh, his family left Russia to move to uh, and eventually settled in, in Shanghai, China, uh, where he lived for many years. And that's where his early education was. That's where he really developed um, as, as a, an adult. And he was fleeing the pogroms. He was fleeing the pogroms of Russia and, and landed in Shanghai where he worked for his dad as a furrier. And then he uh, eventually migrated to Israel. Yeah. And his parents came to New York. Uh, so. And then my mom, on the other hand, was a Holocaust survivor. So she was originally from Poland, but uh, spent time in a uh, concentration camp in, uh, in Germany, Ravensbrück. And, uh, and then ultimately at an orphanage, uh, Bergen-Belsen, and finally she landed in Israel as well at a kibbutz outside of Jerusalem, which is still in existence. It's uh, called Kiryat Anavim. And, it's a, it's a, and that's where, by the way, they begat a son, and, and that would be me. Um, but having said that, one of the things that was wonderful growing up in that household is uh, my dad spoke, I think, six languages. My mother spoke five. And so it was like living in a little UN. You know, we had folks over who spoke lots of different so right. lots of different languages so my dad spoke uh, in addition to chinese and russian he also went to a french school in right. in the french concession of shanghai wow. and so uh, he also of course spoke hebrew and and russian and uh, and english so then and my mother spoke polish and german and yiddish and um, uh, and, and English, of course, uh, and uh, living in a multicultural environment had a real influence on me. On that's how I sort of thought everybody lives that way. Absolutely. You know, we and, all. Uh, and here you are in Maryland, which is you know a global destination right. for uh, people who are in the health industry, who yeah. are relating to the federal government. Um, you know, we have, I think, in Montgomery County. I know in Silver Spring there are, there are more people born in other countries than are born in Montgomery County or right. in Maryland. Um, so you find that your your global perspective perhaps is relevant to your to your work? Absolutely. With all the things that we do at ARP, and I know that we specifically reach out to multicultural communities. And yeah. it's one of the things we're really pressed hard to do because we want to make sure that everyone, it's a part of the fabric of America. And it's a, certainly a part of the fabric of, of Maryland. And we're, of course, a statewide organization as well as a, uh, a national organization. But we are very much interested in becoming part of the fabric of local communities here in Montgomery and, and We'll talk more about this, about how Montgomery County is becoming an age-friendly community. Right. Uh, uh, that uh, with ARP's participation, uh, we'll talk more about that uh, as we get along. Excellent. Thank you. I love taking care of my mom. It wasn't easy at first. She learned how to better communicate her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Boundaries continues from Denison's Brewing Company in downtown Silver Spring. Montgomery County Council Member Hans Reamer and AARP Maryland State Director Hank Greenberg reflect on how one's perspective and life goals change over time. I remember, you know, 15 years ago, I thought for sure I wanted to be President of the United States. Uh, now I'm in elected office. Um, however, I'm a dad and I've got two boys. And I want to be a great dad. Like, I want to enjoy the life of a dad, and which is one of the greatest things you can be. Um, so my life goals, you know, change. Um, I value things differently now, uh, you know, parks and uh, recreational opportunities and, 
and schools. I see that for a very personal lens. Um, maybe talk a little bit about how your, the goals for your life have changed, and I'd like to address what it is that we need to do to empower people to live the lives that they want for themselves so that they can achieve their potential as they age. Well, going on a personal level, about you talked about the evolution of your own uh, goals uh, over time. Um, I remember that growing up, I, I started playing the piano when I was five, and I was very convinced that I was going to be a concert pianist. Yes. And, uh, and uh, spent many years uh, traveling, and I did a record album when I was about 16. And, wow. and I was just, I was into it big time music, you were and an I still. Pianist. Well, you know, I was really into it. I loved it. I had the yeah. passion, and still do have the passion for music. So then it became a question of is that going to be the career? Uh, I did try teaching piano uh, for a while and decided this was not the career for me. Okay. But I did have a passion also for what's the world around me how does it work I mean and government seemed to be one of those things that said you know that these are the rules by which we live by you know and and I think part of that was an education for me uh, when I was younger I went to a yeshiva which is a Jewish parochial school and in that yeshiva we would learn rules like you know if if you have a cow in in the middle of a farm and the cow gets out and does damage to someone else what are your responsibilities? And that may seem very elemental, but when you're in middle school and you're learning these kinds of concepts about responsibility to community, right. responsibility to individuals, exactly. that to me was, uh, begged me to sort of say, you know, you really need to do more about figuring out how the world works and what you can do to make people's lives better than they are. It's a concept of tikkun olam in Hebrew is the yes. word for um, heal the world. Absolutely. And we're very much, uh, and so, I grew up in Oakland, California. Mm. A lot of poverty in Oakland, California. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you see it around you. Uh, I played on Little League baseball teams with kids who lived in neighborhoods that, you know, I, I would only really drive by on my way to see an Oakland A's game. Mm. It was a very powerful experience to reflect on what did I do to deserve growing up in a household with, you know, good fortune. Yeah. Well, I didn't do anything to deserve this. so. What am I going to do with that? And, you know, I don't know. When, when you see that kind of divide in life opportunities, you can't help but want to do something about it. And that's, right. it's that same motivation to, to heal the world. It's, well, it's you know, for me on, at AARP, what I have found is we have programs such as Life Reimagined. So that's just one example. Life Reimagined is all about the number of people who are getting to that point in their life where they're ready to retire or they, you know, although they're retiring later in life these days, but they've never really thought about how they're going to spend those extra years or right. the extended midlife as our CEO uh, Joanne Jenkins has uh, written a book about disrupt aging and she refers to the extension an extended midlife right. and and you know that's a uh, that's a wonderful concept but you really have to think about how you want to spend that time right. and so life reimagines all is an online program and also uh, an interpersonal program on coaching people on making those choices so that they feel fulfilled because that right. is the number one thing people want what are the building you know, it, it, that's a good question. The number one thing that people want to do is, number one, they want to age in place. They don't right. want to be institutionalized. So we've surveyed our folks, and we know that people want to age in place. Number two, they want to feel fulfilled. And, to the, and the fact that we're getting older, but we're healthier, and we are getting stronger. We're not getting weaker. Age is not a system of decline. It's actually a system of strength and growth. And that's what we're really reflecting on. And it's a change in our culture that hasn't happened, I don't think, ever before. What are you seeing in terms of trends of people's workforce participation as they maybe are reaching 65, 70, 75? It's, it's really the foundation of your, of your well-being is going to be right. the resources that you have at your disposal. Well, you know, one of the ways we said we need to start to tackle uh, those resources yeah. and making sure just this year we passed the Maryland General Assembly passed a bill called work and save we call it work and save where it says that employees of small businesses will be offered as of July 1 will be offered an opportunity to save for retirement right. because we need to have you know we need more than just Social Security Social Security is vital right. 
uh, and it's vital in fact because so many people rely on Social Security for up to 90% of their income. So we're trying to get to younger generations to understand that it, you, will, you will need to protect and update Social Security to keep it solvent for the next 75 years and that's going to be a paramount issue for us as we go in 2017, 2018, 2019. When does this new act uh, take effect? When will workers begin to have an option to save for retirement in a way that they didn't formerly have? Well, the act takes effect actually July 1, but that means that the state regulators are going to come up with how that process will work, and there'll be a state-run uh, um, fund that people would be given the option to. The, the idea here was to make it very easy for small businesses right. to just offer to employees this opportunity. Employees don't have to take it, right. but if they do, it will be a wise decision to, um, to save for the future because you're going to need it. Uh, I remember working on Social Security mm. in, in my early uh, part of my career, and people would say, you know, you've got to let young people invest on their own. And, and they should be able to take their money out of Social Security yeah. and invest on their own. And I always thought, yes, people do need to invest on their own, but they need to do it above and in addition to Social Security. And if you think that the only amount of money that you need to save for retirement is the amount that you're putting towards Social Security, you know, that's a mistake. Right. Like, that's your foundation, but you really are going to have to set aside much more of your, of your income. Uh, at ARP, we have something that we call Take a Stand. It's yeah. a campaign that uh, asks every elected official to uh, put forward a plan. How are you going to update Social Security to make it solvent right. and available to future generations? Right. And we're looking at a 75-year window. We want to make sure, because if not, by the year 2034, there'll be a 25%, up to a 25% cut in Social Security payments to people who we are eligible. We can't. And that's going to be number one on our agenda on the federal level right. uh, as we move forward. Uh, and of course, at the state level, we're doing our best to help people to save by doing the work and save and doing things like that to help people and also to educate people on how do you go about re, uh, remaking yourself. We have a guy who. Um, for the, for the longest time said it was my dream to own a pizza parlor. Mm -hmm. And at age 72, he decided I'm opening up a pizza parlor. Wow. And you know, God bless him. That's life reimagined. That's life reimagined. In my generation, we're gonna live a lot longer than our parents' generation lived. They're gonna live, you know, maybe two, three years more. My kids' generation, they're gonna live longer still. Well, you gotta have money for those right. years. So you're gonna have to save more. Like, right. we gotta save more than generations before. So. That's why some of the cost in these programs is going up, because we're getting the benefit Absolutely. of a longer life, right? And when you think about it, after the year 2000, anyone born after the year 2000 has a better than 50% shot at reaching their 100th birthday. Wow. We need to make sure we take care of our future generations. My kids are eight and five, and I just, I think about that every day as I, as I make a meal for them, you know? I think to myself, is this gonna help them get to be 100, because they may very well get to be a hundred and like I don't think I will but what a what an opportunity they have of course we have to address some of these environmental issues to make sure that getting yeah, to a hundred is a desirable thing we got we got our work cut out for us but times are really changing It will never break us, define us, or keep us still. Because arthritis can't beat us if we beat it first. In the fight against arthritis, you need a weapon. What's yours? Visit the Arthritis Foundation at fightarthritispain.org. Final segment of No Boundaries, coming to you from Denison's Brewing Company in downtown Silver Spring, Montgomery County Council Member Hans Riemer reveals to AARP Maryland State Director Hank Greenberg the challenges he's faced recovering from a broken hip. About a year ago, a little less, I was on day two of a family vacation and um, we were staying with some friends and they had a big trampoline in the backyard. And uh, 
our kids got in the trampoline, my wife, uh, the family's kids, there might have been six of us in the trampoline, and everybody's jumping, and my littlest had kind of fallen, and he was like rolling around, and I realized I might land on him. And so when I came out of a high jump, my feet just went out from underneath me, and I went into the trampoline kind of deeply in a splits position, and I broke my hip. Um, the whole experience, I feel like, has given me a preview of what life is like for many people, you know, in their, maybe in their 80s and 90s, mm. where, you know, I've been walking with a cane when I'm not walking with crutches, you know, mm. this is progress. Wow. But I've discovered what it feels like to, you know, enter a sidewalk, enter a crosswalk. Yeah. And, and get halfway out there and not realize, not know if you can make it to the other side. One of the challenges for my family uh, was, boy, when I came home from that hospital, mm. I'm pretty laid up for quite a while. I can't do chores around the house. You know, I can't make the meals. I can barely even really entertain the kids. In fact, I have to be entertained, more yeah. or less, you know. And my poor wife has gone from having, you know, two boys and a husband to having three boys, basically. Right. That's, that's what happened. It, it opened my mind to the challenges that a caregiver faces, in this case, my wife, the strain that it put on our relationship, right. you know, for me to feel kind of incapable of playing the role that I sure. want to play. Um, I understand that you recently have actually worked on some legislation related to caregiving. I thought maybe you right. could share that. By all means, and, and thanks for sharing that story. It, uh, it is eye-opening. And, you know, it, it has nothing to do with age. Yeah. Uh, you can be at any age exactly. and things happen. And one of the things that we're noticing is that there's going to be many people who are, we have people who are in their 80s and 90s caring for their spouses who are in their 80s and 90s. Right. We have people in the sandwich generation, you know, in their 50s and 60s who are caring for older people. Right. We have people who are grandparents caring for grandchildren. We have there are all sorts of manner in which caregiving is becoming a part of daily life yeah. throughout, uh, throughout the, our population. And one of the things we found out is uh, about four years ago, AARP did a study about long-term care services and found that hospital readmissions that means going back into the hospital for the same thing that you were in there for in the first place, yeah. within 30 days, Maryland scored 44th in the nation. We were not doing well. Oh, wow. So we decided, uh, with the support of AARP throughout the country, uh, in Maryland, I'm thrilled to say that we passed something called the CARE Act. And what that says is, when a patient goes into the hospital, the hospital will ask you if you want to designate a caregiver. Now that caregiver might be a family member, might be a neighbor, it might be someone from the church that you know. Um, it could be anybody. Right. But, and if, that, if you say yes to that, then the, the uh, caregiver's name will go into the record. And if that name goes into the record, they will keep you updated about the progress you're making as a patient. And then most importantly, before you are discharged, the caregiver will be given some training in order to help them to do the best they can to keep you as healthy as possible while you're home. So we wanted to make sure that everyone understands that there's an obligation to inform caregivers and make sure that happens. So that as of October 1 will become law in Maryland and we're very thrilled that the General Assembly and the Governor signed the bill and uh, it's, it's a, big, a big deal. You know, as we age, as uh, more and more people are, are living successfully, we're going to have to tackle those kinds of issues. I yeah. mean, right? right? Aging needs to be recognized as like the greatest gift that is. that humans have ever had. Right. The fact that you live, maybe you could live to be a hundred. Yeah. Um, and and kind of just get comfortable with, you know, clearing the the path for for all the obstacles and and getting smart about caregiving and getting smart about how to be a, a patient. You know, how to be a, a good patient. You're absolutely right about that. You've just given a wonderful rendition of what that whole age-friendly community that Montgomery County has embraced, what that's all about. Because we want to make sure that every aspect of life, whether it's transportation, whether it's education, feeling fulfilled, volunteerism is huge. There are so many people in this country, in this state, and in this county who want to do something valuable with their time and help others, give back to the community. Those who can afford to give back to the community want to do that. One of the things that science is showing is that people who are most successful with aging are people with strong social networks. Yes. Um, you know, they have friends. Right. Intuitively, of course, it makes sense, but, um, you know, we're going to have to all kind of 
invent what it means to age successfully. Well, Hans, one of the ways you do that is to fight isolation. That is right. the number one enemy for people who are particularly on the older side right. of, of uh, life cycle. And one of the things we do, for example, is we've had trainings to teach people to use Facebook and Twitter just to make sure that they are getting out into the community and if they can't necessarily physically do it either temporarily or maybe for longer at least they have some con human connection oh, yeah. with family with friends and they are building that connection so we've made a priority of making sure that we have people who understand and use technology and technology is really going to be the answer to a lot of these things you it know is. whether it's the driverless car right. or whether it's um, oh, all sorts yeah. of other things that are coming about and and there's a there's a wonderful program that AARP mm -hmm. has joined with the um, I think it's JP Morgan yes yeah. JP Morgan and it's an entrepreneurial th it's it's a means of being able to give grants to local people who will uh, come up with an invention an innovation it's called an innovation fund yep. and it's to encourage innovation toward people who are we're all aging, awesome. so to, to, for, so it's for all of us. Yeah. Driverless cars, that, yeah. that really is going <laughs> to have a huge impact on aging, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, mobility is really the foundation right. of successful aging. Your ability to independently go to the store or go visit your family, right. that's what it's all about. And, you know, we work hard on issues like paratransit and taxis and but you're a big biker, so uh, yeah. you tell a little bit about that. Uh, biking, I'm looking forward to biking, hopefully keeping me healthy, yeah. hopefully not getting hit by cars, uh, <laughs> you know, in, uh, well into my old age. Um, I guess, you know, I used to bike to school when I was a kid. Wow. started then, right? I lived a mile from school. I think it was uphill both ways, and my, my parents made me bike, and that was awesome. So I got used to, you know, that lifestyle. Now I bike commute when I can. Mm. Um, obviously, I've been doing it recently because of my injury, but uh, you know, you never have a bad day when you bike commute. And a suburban community like yeah. Montgomery County is built for the automobile, right. and we really have challenges making biking safe. And so, what we're trying to do is figure out what are those priorities where a person who would bike, but they're just the safety right. anxiety keeps them uh, from doing. What do we have to do? to uh, you know, resolve those challenges. And we've got some very sophisticated data-driven mapping tools that can now kind of map, like this neighborhood is a low-stress bike area, mm. and this neighborhood is a low-stress bike area. But in between, you've got a, a high-stress, dangerous connection. So let's figure out how to build a protected bike lane with buffers and pickets so that cars can't hit bikers and let's figure out how to connect those two. Right. Uh, that's that's sort of the concept. That's great. Now you're a biker yourself, I understand. Well, so, I, you know, uh, you, you've recreational, you, you, recreational. You've, uh, recreationally <laughs> ridden a in a 100 mile race. Right. I did the. Uh, I didn't win. Uh, and actually, I'm not even sure it's a race. It's called the Seagull Century over on the eastern shore of yeah. Maryland. Rather flat. They have a 60 mile route. They have a, a shorter route as well, so you don't have to necessarily do the the 100 miles. But uh, yeah, I do love biking and always have. It's funny. It's one of those kind of things. And I'm not particularly athletic, but uh, but I do like that. I also think that you've picked up on something really important, which is pedestrian safety. It's yeah. part of what ARP refers to as having livable communities. Right. And you're doing that. I mean, and Montgomery County has really focused on through the, the, the summits that you've had. You yeah. had one in 2008 and you had another one in 2015, which was right. a senior summit. Um, there are people here in this county who are really thinking long and hard about how to make Montgomery County an age-friendly community and I have to say I congratulate the folks who are doing that Thank we you. have a terrific office on aging you have a terrific um, a group of people there's a the Commission on aging yeah, as well a great group really smart people and we've got some of the smartest most capable people retiring from really um, incredible jobs who are willing to get involved here in Montgomery County you know we, we created a fellowship program to help leverage their expertise into government roles I mean, the people who live here in our community are our greatest asset, our greatest resource. And as they age, it's, you know, hopefully we'll figure out how to take advantage of that in, in new and promising ways. Hank Greenberg, thank you very much for coming out to talk to me This today. has been great. And I really appreciate your work. And uh, I hope the folks in Montgomery County get a better sense of who you are and what you're about. Thanks so much.